today on Living Power. And the God of truth says he has a steadfast love for you, and he still loves you. <laughs> you need to discover that. And you need to let it sink in. Just let it sink in and rest there. And as the scripture says, abide, rest, dwell in God's love. Rest in God's love. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Let's go to the Lord and let's uh, give him this time. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you that we can, uh, we can trust you for problems that we have in our lives and uh, questions that we have in our lives that we have no answers for. But Father, you do, and you're not wringing your hands in despair. You know exactly what we're going through and what we have to look forward to. So Father, uh, give us that hope and that comfort and that peace. Now, Father, as we uh, study your word today, uh, as we answer these questions, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us insight to your word, insight to our lives, and what you want to do in and through our lives. I pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, today, um, our, our church is voting on a new pastor. And so, um, by the time, I mean, right now, that is pretty much done. The voting is... is um, maybe going on right now online. I don't exactly remember the timing on that, but it's uh, it's about to close for those of you who are online. And uh, at uh, later on this afternoon, there's going to be a, an online time uh, where we announce the results of the voting. And uh, if it's positive, of course, then there will be a time of celebration. Um, so uh, be in prayer for that. Pray that the Lord will, will send us the man that he wants us to have. For those of you who are voting, vote according to what God is leading you to vote for, uh, not according to what other people have told you, okay? And uh, next Sunday, God willing, we're going to actually meet again in our in our classroom uh, at our church building at 11 o'clock, just the same time that we do this lesson. And we'll be practicing social distancing, including uh, distance seating. The way we're going to set it up uh, is we're going to have chairs set up by twos or by ones and uh, all socially distanced and um, uh, I know some of you are going to want to move your chairs together and that's okay that's that's not a problem uh, it's up to you it's to make that decision but uh, uh, we're doing this setting it up so that we at least are practicing social distancing and um, um, you have to wear a mask please wear a mask Please understand the importance of wearing a mask. It's not only a matter of health, but it's also a matter of the law. And so if you're not willing to wear a mask, do the appropriate thing and, and don't come, okay? That just makes everybody else uncomfortable and it's an awkward situation. So, And if you're not comfortable um, yet coming back to class, uh, that's fine. Stay home uh, and watch the class online. We totally respect that. I'm. I'm not completely comfortable with, with, with going either, but I'm confident that, that we can maintain the necessary safety precautions to meet again, and so um, we're doing that. And, uh, and uh, so we, we'll start doing that, and for the, for the near future anyway, at least through January, uh, we're going to be doing it that way. The um, uh, Kansas City has decided, and we tend to follow uh, suit with what Kansas City decides about these matters <clears throat> has decided to extend um, the parameters uh, through January or into the middle of January. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we're going to be doing the same thing at our church at least into January. Uh, today, as I mentioned uh, last Sunday, will be uh, I'll be answering your Bible questions. I ask that if you had any Bible or doctrinal questions uh, that you submit them to me during the week, and uh, I would uh, address them today. And we basically got two questions. Now, it was from different folks, but they both were seemed, seemed to be the same question. It was kind of unusual. So I've combined them, and, uh, and I will address those questions. And the first question actually came from, from uh, a couple of different people, actually more than a couple. But anyway, it was about the Abraham Accord. Now, 
how does the Abraham Accord fit in with the end times? Now you're going, what is the Abraham Accord? Well, this past week, a joint statement by President Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi uh, of the United Arab Emirates, uh, this, this statement was agreed, uh, released agreeing to full normalization of relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, sometimes just referred to as the Emirates. Uh, President Trump referred to this agreement as the Abraham Accord, and there was much celebration in the White House and in Israel uh, regarding this agreement, uh, which has taken a number of years to develop. Now, I understand where the question is coming from. We're wondering if this agreement fits in with the peace treaty that will initiate the tribulation, as taught in in Daniel. In fact, in in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it says, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. Uh, That's referring to the Antichrist. He will make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week, now the week refers to seven years, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So the first three and a half years will be peace. The second three and a half years uh, will not be peace. And um, uh, that's what Daniel 9.27 teaches about this, the tribulation. And uh, so the question is, does this agreement fit in with that? Well, actually, there has been such an agreement in place with two other Arab nations. Uh, in Egypt since 1979, and in Jordan since 1994. So this Abraham Accord is really no different from those agreements. Uh, But how significant is this treaty? Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, The Emirates is a very small country of about 9 million inhabitants. And the truth of the matter, uh, uh, by the way, out of that 9 million, around seven and a half to eight million of them are expatriates. So um, it's an interesting it's an interesting little country. But the truth of the matter is that they've been cooperating with Israel for a number of years. And the significance is that they have signed a, a, a treaty to cooperate and normalize relations. They, they were cooperating, but now they've signed a treaty that they will continue to cooperate and normalize. And that probably means that Israel will put an embassy in, uh, in the Emirates. <clears throat> the Emirates will put an embassy in, in Israel. We don't know if it will be in Jerusalem or, or uh, somewhere else. But in any case, that's what normalization of relations basically means, that they'll cooperate uh, with trade, uh, with the exchange of intelligence and things like that. Now, that may open the door for some other cooperation with other Arab nations, Uh, What would really be significant would be if Saudi Arabia decided to jump in on this accord, but uh, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. But Israel's real enemies are not on board with this. Iran, uh, Syria, Iraq, Gaza, uh, Lebanon, they're not going to sign this accord. And uh, in fact, they still have every intention to destroy Israel, and they curse this accord. So, in spite of all the posturing and, and backslapping, um, this is a very small step in the right direction, or maybe in the wrong direction, depending on how you look at it. What the world and Israel needs to be watching for is something that is prophesied in Ezekiel, and it includes Russia being involved in an act of aggression against Israel. It's in Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 10 through 12. Thus says the Lord God, On that day, thoughts will come into your mind, it's talking about Russia, and you will devise an evil scheme and say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates, to seize spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, and the people who are gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell at the center of the, of the earth. So, according to this prophecy, Israel is going to be lulled into a sense of peace with her Uh, with the surrounding nations and even those who were enemies um, and others who who, uh, don't seem to have been enemies 
and uh, all of those nations are going to decide to attack Israel for her wealth and her land. Now we know already that, uh, that a number of these nations want the land. They say that Israel is an occupier, and so they, they want to oust them and claim the land for, for Palestine and for the Arab nations and to turn it into a Muslim uh, nation. Um, but in, in this passage, what we see is that Israel is going to be essentially, there are going to apparently have been some peace treaties or some of these normalization treaties where Israel feels like there is finally some peace. And in that peace, then that's where this is going to happen. But it's from this event that where where this attack comes on on Israel while Israel thinks everything is is going well it's from this event that we see the rise of the antichrist who will get all these nations to sign a 7 year peace treaty with Israel and that will usher in the great tribulation which will essentially be three and a half years of peace followed by three and a half years of devastation that the world has has never known so that's what this this Abraham Accord, that's the way I see this Abraham Accord. It's, um, it's just a, a, an agreement between uh, an Arab country and Israel to normalize relations, which is one step toward that sense that there is peace happening in, in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, which is a good thing, but it is going to lead eventually to uh, this peace treaty, which will usher in uh, the, the Great Tribulation. Now... Uh, let's take a look at the second question, uh, which was submitted this past week. And I want to spend some time on, on this question. What do you do when you are discouraged or frustrated in your ministry and you feel like God doesn't even love you anymore? Now, this question came in various forms, you know, different, different ways. People worded it differently. And so I just kind of combined it all to, to say basically this. Uh, first of all, let's deal with this feeling that God doesn't even love you anymore. Or perhaps that he doesn't care about you anymore. Or he just doesn't seem to be interested in you anymore. Um, have you ever, in your relationship with another person, uh, felt like that person just doesn't love you anymore? What did you base that on? Now, there may be some issues that have happened there that, that there is some, some problems there in that relationship caused by maybe an affair or, or just losing interest or just losing a, a focus in a relationship. But a lot of times that feeling where we feel like our, that our partner doesn't really love us anymore is based on a pattern of behavior that didn't line up with our experience of love with that person. In other words, because that person wasn't acting the same way towards you as in the past, you questioned their love for you. For example, they may have used to have done something or done certain things or said certain things and now they don't anymore. So you think, well, maybe that means that they don't love you anymore. We've all gone through that at, at some point. Um, but it's part of growing up. I mean, I remember um, I've heard so many people say, well, I'm just not married to the person that I married, and, uh, or this person has changed. Well, we all change, um, and we all go through these differences, and, and hopefully it's maturity, but we all go through changes, and that includes changes in uh, certain patterns of behavior. I remember feeling that way about Marsha one time. Uh, I was, you know, I felt like, well, she just doesn't love me like she used to. And I was sitting in the living room and I was working on my computer. And as Marsha walked through the living room, I noticed she was carrying my, <laughs> she was carrying my dirty underwear on the way to the laundry room. And uh, I suddenly realized she still loves me. She's just not expressing it the way she used to. I mean, she always washed my clothes, but uh, she, she obviously would. <laughs> She loves me if she's going to wash my dirty underwear, isn't she? There's a, a similar thing that happens in our relationship with God. Sometimes God doesn't act the way or the same way towards us uh, as we're used to when we, f when we felt that God loved us. In other words, uh, his pattern of behavior 
doesn't line up with our experience of his love in the past. And we want that past feeling back. But a feeling uh, is about a past experience that defines how we feel about a current situation. Let me say that again. A feeling is about a past experience that defines how we feel about a current situation. So, you, so we tend to base whether or not somebody loves us based on how things were five, ten years ago. But that doesn't mean that they don't love us. That just means that our expressions have changed or our patterns of behavior have changed. So, let me ask you this. Does God still love you? 1 John 4.16 is really key to understanding this issue in the lives of so many Christians who wondered about this. 1 John 4.16 So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Now get this. It is a process to come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. It is a process. Do you see that? We have come to know and to believe. So there was a process of getting to that point of knowing and believing that God loves us. And that process is centered on the foundation of abiding in God's love. Now, the idea of abiding is to rest in something or to dwell in something, to spend time with something. And right there is the reason that uh, so many people get frustrated and burned out in their ministry. They've gotten so busy and focused on their ministry that they've neglected to just rest in the very motivation for their ministry, God's love. They've become more driven by the need than by the source of their ministry. That happens a lot. It's happened in my life. It's hap I saw it happen in my parents' lives. I've seen that happen in a lot of people's lives. They've got a ministry, and they get so focused on the ministry, and they know that there's a need for that ministry, and they're driven by the need instead of motivated by the reason they have the ministry, which is God's love. And listen, you can't love on your own. It's got to be God's love. Remember, love is allowing God to do something in someone else's life through you. And if you're not spending time with God, if you're not abiding in God then that kind of closes the door for God to be able to love somebody else through you. So you begin loving other people or doing other things for other people or meeting needs based on their need, based on your motivation to meet their need instead of your motivation to please God and to let God motivate you by his love. Second John 3 says this, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, in truth and love. Now get what this verse is saying. As a child of God, all of God's grace, all of God's mercy, all of God's peace, all of God's truth, all of God's love, is yours. It's there. I want you to catch this principle. All of this is yours. The God is, is that God is the God of all of these things, and He gives them to you. But I want you to focus on this in particular. God says here, God is the God of truth. He has never lied, and He never will. Now look how He refers to Himself in Isaiah 65. He who blesses Himself in the land shall bless Himself by the God of truth. In other words, if you're blessed, if you really are blessed, you're blessed by God, the God of truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and hidden from my eyes. Now, hold on to that. God calls himself the God of truth. 
And look at what this God of truth speaks to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. Now the word for thousands is interesting. It's a word that suggests thousands that produce thousands. Uh, in other words, innumerable. And so this idea is, is, is that God has a steadfast love for people. Get what kind of love God says he has for you. For you, he has a steadfast love. His love for you doesn't change. The way you feel about it might change. But God's love doesn't change. In fact, in the New Testament, James teaches this. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now get that. God doesn't change. All of the good things in your life, all of those things, all those blessings that have come on your life, God still wants you to have them. God hasn't changed. He blesses you with a love that doesn't change. Listen, if God is the God of truth, and he says he loves you steadfastly, his love for you hasn't changed. He loves you as much now as he did when he hung on a cross for you. And look at what that did for you. Look at what God's salvation did for you. Hebrews 2.11 For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified those are those of us who are believers, Christians for he who sanctifies, that's Jesus and those of us who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Hold on to that. Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, in other words, gave them a destiny, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. <laughs> this is rich. This is rich. What those verses clearly say is that Jesus thinks of you as family. And he thinks of you as a brother. In other words, he thinks of himself as your brother. And he thinks of you as a brother or a sister. Now, if Jesus is your brother, think about this. Your big brother died on a cross for you because he loved you so much. No, you didn't know him at the time. But he knew you. In fact, we just read about it. Romans 8, 29. He said, those whom he foreknew. Your big brother knew about you when he hung on the cross and died for your sin. Because he loved you. And the God of truth says he has a steadfast love for you. And he still loves you. You need to discover that. And you need to let it sink in. Just let it sink in and rest there. And as the scripture says, abide, rest, dwell in God's love. Rest in God's love. Now listen to what I'm about to say here. Because this is life transforming. You may need to back off of your ministry for a bit. And find the time to rest in God's love. I'm not saying quit your ministry. But maybe you need, to t you need that time to refocus on the source of your ministry instead of the goal of your ministry. Now remember, I'm not saying quit your ministry. But you may need to back off a little bit so you find more time to rest to abide in God's love. 
Look at what Jude 20 and 21 says. Jude is one chapter long. So verses 20 and 21 say this. But you, beloved. Beloved by who? Oh, by God. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's the same thing as saying as abide in God. Keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So, keep yourselves. Keep, actually, the word for keep actually means to guard. But it's it, to guard yourself in the love of God. Protect yourself with God's love. But the principle is the same as abiding in God's love. You're resting, you're dwelling, you're spending time embracing God's love. Well, how do you keep yourself in God's love? Well, that's answered in verse 20. You, answer, you, you, you keep yourself in God's love, you abide in God's love by, first of all, growing your faith. Now, remember what faith is. We've defined faith, the application of faith anyway, as trusting obedience to the known will of God. Trusting obedience to the known will of God. It's not guessing, it's not hoping, it's not wishing. It's obeying what you know is the will of God, what God has already taught you in his word, what you know God wants you to do, what God expects from you. You've been taught by the word, and you know these things are true, and so you trustingly obey those. That's where you start. And as you learn more things, as God reveals more things for you to do, you grow your faith. Faith is trusting obedience to the known will of God. And as you know more of the will of God, then your faith grows. So that's the first thing, how you keep yourself, the first thing of how you keep yourself in God's love. The second thing is praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people have take the term praying in the Holy Spirit and they define it as a method. Um, it, maybe it's praying in tongues or going through particular chants or going through a particular m meditation process. or you know There are different ways that people have defined it, but they're actually reading something into this that just isn't there. Praying in the Holy Spirit just simply means this. It's the transparent, honest, quiet commune with God, not influenced by anything other than God's will and desire for him. That's what praying in the Holy Spirit is. Remember, Holy Spirit is God. It's the Spirit of God dwelling in you. And so that means that you're communing with God in a very transparent, honest, open. You're being, you're being so brutally honest with God. And you're not influenced by anything other than God's will and, and your desire for Him. That's why I say praying in the Holy Spirit is something that you do on your own, it's by yourself. Because if you're in a group, it's hard to do it that way. It's hard to be transparent and honest and quiet with God and let Him speak to you and you just spend time with God being perfectly honest. Because you're influenced by what other people are saying, what other people are doing. You need to find that time by yourself where you're praying in the Holy Spirit. You're transparent, you're honest, you're quiet with God, not influenced by any other thing other than God's will and your desire for him. That's when you begin to discover what the Apostle Paul spoke about in Ephesians. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Oh, let's just take our time with this passage. This is so good. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, not ministry, not doing things, not thinking things, but just grounded in God's love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love 
of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the goodness or the, the fullness of God that you may be filled with all of God in your life do you realize that God says he will fill you with himself that's what that passage is saying and when you try to do ministry when you're half empty you're going to struggle and when you try to do ministry when you're almost completely empty you're going to stall you need to find some time to rest with God. Get into God's love. Discover that love anew because that love is what's going to motivate you to accomplish your ministry. If you're accomplishing or trying to accomplish your ministry on your own, on your own strength and your own power, you're dead in the water. But when you're motivated by God's love, you're all powerful. But you have to abide in God's love for that to happen. So take some time. Begin abiding in God's love. Let him empower you. When you know that God loves you, nothing will stop you. Nothing. I share that with you because this is really important to know this. You can't do ministry properly anyway. You can't do ministry unless you are motivated by God's love. Let's pray. And let me pray for you. God, I pray that you would speak to each one of us about this very important issue. Give us a sense of your love. Renew that in our lives. Father, so many, so many of your children, so many Christians are just drained. And they're stressed out about the circumstances that they're living in, stressed out about this pandemic, stressed out about their jobs, about their family, about their relationships, about their finances. So many things that stress us out. And God, we just need to find a refreshing time in you. So God, would you begin to work in our lives? Cause us to be renewed in your love, motivated by your love to accomplish what you want to accomplish in us and through us. Renew our faith by renewing that love, that sense of love in our lives. I pray in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, next week we meet in our physical classroom, uh, the atrium, that's the name of the room at, at Connection Point. If you have, have not attended our class uh, before, and uh, would like to visit us, you are more than welcome to visit us. You don't have to join anything. Uh, you don't have to pay anything. Uh, you just, uh, you know, and you're not going to be singled out. Um, we just, uh, it's a pretty large class. Well, I don't know what the size of it will be over the next few weeks, but it is a large class generally. And uh, we just don't single people out. We don't embarrass people. Uh, and so you are more than welcome to come and, and uh, study with us. Feel free to go to our website, which is uh, theopenclass.com. That's the website, theopenclass.com. Go to that website, poke around in there, and get some more information about our class. The address is in that website. And then how to find our class is also on that website. You can find that under FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions. And uh, you can get some more information about our class. In the meantime, uh, for those of you who are who are regular in our class and you know where we, we meet, if you want to join us on Sunday in person, then you are welcome. Uh, we'll, we'll do our absolute best to make sure that, uh, that you are safe. Wear your mask and uh, we'll have separate places to sit. I'll also have a, a pile of, of uh, hand sanitizer around so you can uh, lather yourself in that and... Uh, Boy, isn't it interesting to go places now and smell that stuff? <laughs> it used to be so different. Uh, anyway, uh, again, a reminder, if you're not comfortable attending class yet, that's fine. Uh, we'll continue to broadcast our class live right here on our Facebook page at the same time that we always do, which is 11 o'clock uh, Central Time, for those of you who uh, aren't in Central Time. 
uh, 11 o'clock Central Time. And uh, so, but we'll be broadcasting the the Bible study from our class. So it'll be a little bit different. Although the good thing about it is that you'll be able to see the PowerPoints uh, that way. This way, uh, uh, Tim, and I appreciate Tim Martineau so much uh, for taking the time to, he posts all the verses as we, as we study along. He posts them in the chat room. And so thank you, Tim, for your faithfulness in, in doing that. And, uh, um, and, and then Brian takes the video and posts it on uh, the uh, open class. There are two other open class uh, pages on Facebook uh, that uh, Brian takes care of, and he posts the video on those, and he also posts it on YouTube. So uh, somebody asked me the other day, how many, how many messages do we have out? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how many. I, it, I lost count after 1,000. So... Um, but there are quite a few out there. It's pretty amazing. And Brian is responsible for all of that. So blame him. Um, anyway, uh, so we'll see you next Sunday if you're going to be with us at class. If not, we'll see you here online. God bless you. I hope you have an awesome week. Uh, I hope God just really anoints the week and that you you have a renewed sense of of God's calling on your life and a sense of, of God's love that he has a passion for you and that he wants to do something special in your life and he's ready to do that as you, as you let him. Um, have a great week and uh, we'll see you next Sunday either at church or here online. In the meantime, you go away. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.